Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the birthmark and Rappuccini's daughter, Hawthorne's Mad Scientist, an online professional development seminar sponsored by America in Class from the National Humanities Center. My name is Richard Schramm. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs here at the Center, and I'll be moderating this evening's session. Before we get underway, I'd like to just introduce you briefly to the National Humanities Center. We're an institute for advanced study located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. Our main mission is to provide fellowships to scholars from all over the world to come here and research and write on topics and subjects like history and literature and le literature and language studies, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. We also offer a lot of programs and resources for high school teachers of American history and literature. You folks have found our webinars. If you go to americanclass.org, that will land you on this page. And from here, you can gain access to all of the online resources that we offer for the teaching of American culture. If you go to our uh, lessons page uh, in America in Class early next week, you will see this lesson. That word there, private, right now, uh, that means that uh, this is not available to the public. But early next week, that word private will be taken away. And Almer's Motivation in Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Birthmark, a lesson from the National Humanities Center, will be available to you. You will find text-dependent close reading questions with responses for teachers for a teaching guide. Uh, you'll find a printable worksheet for use with students that will contain those same questions without the responses. But I think you'll really enjoy the interactive exercises that we built into this uh, lesson. Uh, this particular lesson takes you through um, outlining a paper on uh, students, rather, through an outlining a paper on Hawthorne's story, The Birthmark. We will email you when that becomes available. Please check it out. I think it will be a great asset for your classes. Now, after our seminar this evening, if you will go to the, Ameri to the uh, Birthmark and Rappuccini's Daughter webpage, the seminar webpage, you'll find there a recording of the seminar, the PowerPoint presentation. And we invite you to plunder the PowerPoint presentation for your uh, classrooms. That's what it's there for. If you want to use any of our ideas, quotes, questions, please just take them from the PowerPoint. You will also find on this website an evaluation. Please fill that out and send it back to us. And once you do, you'll be able to download your certificate of participation, which you will be able to present to your local certifying authority to obtain whatever recertification credit your participation in this seminar warrants. Now, how do you participate? Well, throughout the seminar, our, our scholar, Eliza Richards, will be uh, presenting excerpts uh, from the stories. And from time to time, we'll stop and ask discussion questions. And we hope you'll respond. If you want to respond, put your cursor in the uh, box that I have marked off in green there. Put your response in there. Hit that Send button to the right. Your message will appear in the larger chat box above. I will be monitoring the chat all night, and I'll be bringing it into the conversation at appropriate moments. Now, we hope you respond to our questions, but please don't be afraid to ask your own questions or make comments. Give us feedback on how you teach the material. If you see a passage that is usable in class, let us know how you'd present it. And if you see a potential project or assignment in the material, share it. These seminars work best when we have a lot of exchange with our participants. So the more you participate, the better the, we the webinar. So don't hesitate. If you have a question or a comment, please feel free, put it in the chat. We'll bring it into the discussion if we can. Well, let's get underway. We are very pleased to have with us this evening Eliza Richards, an associate professor of literature at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She was a National Humanities Center fellow, and when she was here at the center, she was working on a book called Correspondent Lines, Poetry and Journalism in the U.S. Civil War. She's written widely on American literature. You see two of her publications there, Emily Dickinson in Context 2013, and Gender in the Poetics of Reception in Edgar Allan Poe Circle, 2004. So let me mute Eliza's microphone and turn the program over to her. Eliza, tell us about these mad scientists. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome, and uh, thank you for uh, coming to our seminar. Um, I'm here at the birthmark and Rappuccini's daughter. But first, I'd like to hear a little bit about how you teach the two stories. Um, how many of you already teach the birthmark in your classes? How many of you teach Rappuccini's daughter? And what sorts of things do you emphasize in the two stories when you teach them? Do you ever teach them together? Um, and besides the themes that you might compare, because they're clearly both about um, crazy scientists who are obsessed with their uh, with female 
figures that they have close emotional relationships to, um, what other things do you consider when you teach uh, the courses, the stories in your courses? Okay, let us hear from you. How do you teach these two stories, if indeed you teach them? Our sense here at the Center from talking to teachers is that the birthmark is more widely taught than Rappuccini's daughter, but we're not sure about that. So let us know. Uh, let's hear from you. There we have multiple people typing, Eliza. Uh, Tracy, I teach the birthmark in my seventh grade class, and I emphasize the elements of perfection and the problems with striving for perfection. Yes, undoubtedly a great yeah, problem among seventh graders. Yeah, one of the central graders. problems in the story, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Anyone else? So we've got a number of people typing here I can see on the board. Um, let's see what, what more we get. That theme of perfection certainly does run through both stories, an important theme um, related to some of the other stories that uh, <clears throat> we might study from. To hear what on. you do will help uh, me bring out certain things in the slides as well, okay, so I welcome. I teach both in a course called Women in Literature. Ah, themes, the problems with fooling around with nature, like Dr. Frankenstein's elements. Eden, ref Eden references is one fun item, certainly in... Uh, that so, is a fun item, and we're going to pick that up a little bit yeah, this evening. Certainly yeah. in Rappuccini's Daughter, Great. kind of inverted Eden. Let's, let's just get a few more, and then we'll move on to talk yeah. about similarities here. We've got some, uh, some good responses. Uh, they'll be coming in. I feel like waiting, for, like waiting for election returns. Here, I teach both and talk about male sexual aggression as a result of the Industrial Revolution and men's feelings of uncertainty. Eliza, that, those are some themes that, that I didn't catch. That's really interesting. Yes, that's great. That's yeah. great, a sense of being... Um, unmanned that might be driving the masculine uh, the, the masculine striving in the, in, the, in the stories. That's a great point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and the Industrial Revolution, that, that, uh, that, that's really interesting. And then the, the male sexual aggression, that will connect with some of the themes you'll bring, on late, you'll bring up later on. And then, uh, let's see. Okay, why don't we move ahead, and while, sure. while people are, are are typing in from that last answer, I will uh, I will bring that in, but let's talk about similarities. Okay, great, great. Yeah, so what kinds of things, the stories really do have an awful lot of overlap, um, and in a way, it would make a lot of sense to compare them, um, but in order to compare and to contrast, it's important to think about what the similarities are and what the differences are between the, sto to the stories. So what are some of the similarities that you see that you could bring out when you're teaching between the two stories? Why would they make a good pair to teach together? Okay, so what similarities do you see? And while we're waiting for that, uh, I teach both stories at times, sometimes along with other Hawthorne short stories as well. Generally, the focus is Hawthorne as a romantic writer. Uh, we delve into more as well. And then we have a common theme, man's attempt to play God. One sure, certainly both of them are godlike figures who are obsessed with uh, uh, a rising above humanity. Right, an important theme. We have some others coming across... Uh, the, uh, the airwaves tonight. Uh, let's see what other th similarities uh, our participants have identified as they teach the two stories. The whole male uh, trying to create fe the female issue. Yes, yes, <laughs> trying, trying, trying to create yes, a woman, a the woman of your dreams, so to speak, or <laughs> nightmares, whatever the whatever the case may be. Let's let's hear one more, and then we'll move on to uh, the similarities. Uh, We've identified, let's see, okay. all right, while our, there we go, science in the stories makes for great connections, it does. indeed it does. Yeah, and it's interesting in relation to the uh, comment about the Industrial Re Revolution, because they're both old-fashioned scientists mm -hmm. set back in time, um, alchemists even, magicians in a way, and so it's interesting to think about the relationship of science to art and science, the kind of science in the stories that in relation to modernity and modernization and industrialization. So mm -hmm. that's We great. have two other similarities. Almer and Giovanni are characters of the Enlightenment coming up against the romanticism of Georgiana and Rappuccini's daughter and the women who are willing to perhaps sacrifice themselves for their men. Yes, definite similarities. Well, why don't we move on to, to our next yeah. slide? And we so can... here's a list of the similarities, and I'm sure that you could uh, use in the classroom to think about uh, the issue with your students. Um, a lot of there are lots of formal similarities, thematic similarities, imagistic similarities. Um, there's a as someone already pointed out, there's an important uh, stress 
on um, Christian imagery, especially imagery uh, of original sin, the Garden of Eden. Um, they're, uh, they're scientists, but they're also wizard figures. Um, there's uh, an obsession with um, their warning characters. Um, there's an obsession with power, as someone noted. So all these things are, uh, are there are many parallels. Um, and then there's a question of what are some of the differences? Um, why did, did he write the same story twice? Or uh, what is what difference, divergences do you see between these two stories that m makes it important to read both of them and think about them in comparison? Okay, now switching gears, what differences do you see in the stories? Well, one difference that jumped out at me right away, one deals with a wife, one with a daughter. There are lots of yeah. others. Let's see what they are. Let's get a few of our participants here to uh, comment on that. Yeah, I, I, I think that is a good question, Eliza. Did he write the same story twice? And if right. so, why? That's, that's, I was the trying to puzzle Rappuccini's that Rappuccini's Daughter was written about one year after the birthmark published, about one year later. Um, and there's an interesting question of whether Rappuccini builds on or changes some of the ideas that he explored in the birthmark. Um, is it a more complex story? Mm -hmm. I see we're fading in and out uh, for at least one person. I hope that's not a, a general problem. Um, Are people having trouble with the audio? Uh, apparently one one of our participants uh, is. I hope that other people aren't. That's not something that we can okay. control from here. Uh, I believe okay. that Rappuccini is a stronger, more intense story than the birthmark. I, yeah, I think. I actually agree. Yeah, yeah, I think I agree with that. Um, I think they're both fascinating stories, but Rappuccini tackles more, and we can talk about um, why why that seems to be the case. Some people may disagree, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't we move on and, and display yes. our slide with our differences? Yeah, so here are some of the differences that we notice, and of course it's not um, the only difference that there are. Um, one, one thing that does seem to lend to greater sophistication or complexity in Rappuccini's Daughter is the third point, point that um, uh, birthmark is uh, completely contained inside basically a laboratory, and there are just the two women there, uh, the, um, the husband and wife with Amina Dab, the servant, whereas Rappuccini's daughter reaches out to a broader world um, and creates a more sort of um, complex environment for them to be working within. So, but there are other things uh, that are different, and it's interesting to think about what's different and what's the same, given their, the, they seem such parallel stories. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Baglioni and um, and Giovanni really do complicate that story, as we'll see. Yes, yeah. So here's the sort of setup. We've decided to compare different um, different characters um, and what and the sorts of issues they bring out, as given that the two stories have so many parallels. Um, so we'll look at some of the uh, and actually there are many more parallels than this. You could compare uh, ba Baglioni with Amina Dab. Um, you could compare um, <laughs> Eilmer with Giovanni. So it's interesting the way the characters all double one another. Um, so it's an interesting way to think about the relationship between the stories and to work that through. Mm -hmm. We have a question here that we'll get to later on. Isn't Rappuccini trying to create a super race? And we just discovered another comparison. I hadn't thought about this until just now, but these stories would be a great pairing with Frankenstein. Seems so obvious tonight. Well, our first epiphany. I like the name Rap. I think that's yeah. good. Good for. <laughs> let's call Rapp. him Rap from now on. Um, okay, so let's start with Georgiana and Beatrice. As people noted, the um, treatment of women and the understanding of women, the men's understanding of women, is really central to the story. Um, the narration is crucial. So the women don't speak for themselves. Usually, as someone said, there's in many ways, sacrificing themselves, sacrificial figures. So really what we get about them is from masculine perspectives, both the narrator who's masculine identified and the characters that interact with them. Uh, two characters, father and the um, young man in uh, Rappuccini's daughter and um, Almer, 
and the birthmark. So here are some of the questions that um, could be brought out to frame, and it sounds like some of you are working with those in your classroom already. Um, what sorts of meanings do the male characters assign to Georgiana and Beatrice? And that's different than what are their inherent characteristics? Um, how do they see the women? What do women in particular, why do they carry such a weight of symbolism? Because they're they're doing an awful lot of work in the men's imaginations, um, and why is that? Uh, why why aren't they creating uh, male figures? Why are they creating female figures? Um, what does this suggest about women's cultural role in the 19th century, as uh, and distinct, if maybe continuous, with today? Um, and what's Hawthorne's perspective on the men's tendency? Does he agree with it? Um, is he supportive of it or is he critiquing it? Um, so those are some of the questions we'll be thinking about in the background as we go through the next slides. Um, and you'll notice uh, one of the things I find difficult with Hawthorne teaching my, my college students is the elaborate ornate quality of his prose. And here we have an example of that in this rather long passage about Georgiana that's only a, a real a segment of a much longer um, portion. And it, it, it focuses specifically um, a, on the symbolism of the birthmark and how men see it. Um, masculine, and I'll read it for you and think about the discussion questions at the side. Um, masculine observers, if the birthmark did not heighten their admiration, contented themselves with wishing it away, that the world might possess one living specimen of ideal loveliness without the semblance of a flaw. Had she been less beautiful, if envy's self could have found aught else to sneer at, he might have felt his affection heightened by the prettiness of this mimic hand, now vaguely portrayed, now lost, now stealing forth again, and glimmering to and fro with every pulse of emotion that throbbed within her heart. But seeing her otherwise so perfect, Almer found this one defect grow more and more intolerable with every moment of their united lives. It was a fatal flaw of humanity, which nature, in one shape or another, stamps ineffaceably on all her productions, either to imply that they are temporary and finite, or that their perfection must be wrought by toil and pain. The crimson hand expressed the ineludible in, in gripe in which mortality clutches the highest and purest of earthly mold, degrading them into kindred with the lowest and even the very brutes, like whom their visible frames return to dust. In this manner, selecting it as a symbol of his wife's liability to sin, sorrow, decay, and death, Almer's somber imagination was not long in rendering the birthmark a frightful object, causing him more trouble and horror than ever Georgiana's beauty, whether of soul or sense, had given him delight. So clearly, Almer's, I find that it's good to read these passages aloud and get the students to focus in, because it's not just verbiage, there's a lot of um, subtle texture to the passage that helps us understand how Almer's thinking. Um, and clearly he's loading a lot of weight onto this birthmark. Um, so how does he understand it? And why is it so different from the lighter interpretation of the other men who see the object, um, uh, who see the mark on her face? Eliza, we um, have some excellent responses here in the chat. Uh, I think for Hawthorne, the men and women represent the split in the nation. I'd like to come back to that. Uh, Almer finds it an imperfection, which as a scientist, he simply, he seems to know, uh, he, he seems to need to know why. But here's, here's what I find fascinating. The birthmark only becomes something to fear after he and he, Almer, marries Georgina. Having had sex, he finds that she has power over him, one he cannot allow to stand. That, that's fascinating. Yeah, I never. So he, I there's never a kind of revulsion that. he's pushing against her power that we never really see. Yeah, that's really yeah, that changes a lot of my thinking on the story. I believe Hawthorne is quite sympathetic to women in these stories. The only time we will achieve perfection is probably in death, not in life. Hearing the shred, I'm imagining original sin. We'll get to that. A la Eve's yeah. weakness in the garden, and his wife's ability to sin, sorrow, decay, and death is ironic in that everyone. Is subject to those things. I, brilliant comment. That's comments. a great point. Yeah, when he says um, that, I think that's really key. That he's um, he's thinking of it only in terms of his wife. He doesn't say our uh, liability to sin, sorrow, decay, and death. 
Um, and he seems to attribute, that's why you're thinking of original sin in the mm -hmm. Garden of Eden, that it's his wife's liability to sin, as if sin resides in her alone. Yeah. Um, he doesn't seem to be aware that he too is subject to these human things. Yeah. So I think that's that's great. And so he's um, that would mean that he's projecting all this stuff outwards onto her poor onto poor her and her poor birthmark. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And it, it makes a difference that he's married to her rather than someone who still finds her attractive, as someone was saying. Someone who that, that's a horrible thing to say, but um, the other men long for her. He has her, and that makes a difference. So those are great comments. Yeah, yeah and the comment about having had sex with her, I mean, that in my reading of Rappuccini's daughter, that, that sort of feeds into my reading of Rappuccini's daughter because in Giovanni discovers desire within himself and here in uh, this reading of the birthmark, um, Almer discovers desire yeah. and, and both men d don't know really quite what to do with that desire they've just discovered with female themselves. sexuality. Yeah. 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 When, and that's why the, when, when, you can see that in the, it, it, with a, you could bring that out in a close reading, and I'm sure that's where people are getting it. Um, he might have felt his affection heightened by the prettiness of this mimic hand, now vaguely portrayed, now lost, now stealing forth again and glimmering to and fro with every pulse of emotion that throbbed within her heart. So he's noticing her sensual, physical, um, you know, the blood pulsing through her veins, the mm -hmm. radiance of her skin and that sort of thing. So even though he doesn't overtly say anything about sexuality, he's viewing her as a sensual being, um, but then turning it all into an obsession with the crimson hand. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a reading that you could really support well. And it's great. Yeah. So um, that crimson hand reminds him of his connection to the earth. He desires what's what's you know the body on on which that crimson hand appears great yeah we have we have uh, a so, comment we have, have a question something... how is it that one person can lower another self-esteem to the point that they would sacrifice their life for it it never bothered her before we'll we'll, we'll pick that up as we go along Yes, we will. We'll get we'll get towards that. Um, it's and that's a great question. A, a question of whether um, her self esteem is lowered. She does start obsessing with uh, about the birthmark, um, but uh, what her point is when she dies is an in, she has the last word in the story, and we're going to look at that. Um, so yeah, so there's a parallel here in Beatrice's. Um, in, in the way that the men view, and here Giovanni views Beatrice, and we can think about how to pull out the, these kinds of ideas in this passage as well. Um, Soon there emerged from under a sculptured portal the figure of a young girl, arrayed with as much richness of taste as the most splendid of the flowers, beautiful as the day, and with a bloom so deep and vivid that one shade more would have been too much. She looked redundant with life, health, and energy, all of which attributes were bound down and compressed, as it were, and girdled tensely and there luxurious by her virgin zone. <laughs> um, yet Giovanni's fancy must have grown morbid while he looked down into the garden, for the impression which the fair stranger made upon him was as if here were another flower, the human sister of those vegetable ones, as beautiful as they, more beautiful than the richest of them, but still to be touched only with a glove, nor to be approached without a mask. So um, what are the, some of the ways that Giovanni and Almer share preconceptions of women? What are the preconceptions? Um, why are they so obsessed for perfection? and Or why do they want perfection so much? And why, um, if the women they're watching are so perfect, does that bring uh, such extreme thoughts of corruption into their minds? Um, those are some ways that the two things, uh, the two stories can be compared, and Giovanni and Almer can be compared as lovers, one married, one, um, one courting in some way. Mm -hmm. So how would you respond to that? <clears throat> what does Giovanni sh <clears throat> share with Almer in terms of his perceptions of women? Why do they wish for perfection? Why are they obsessed with corruption when the two women are so nearly perfect? Uh, here we have a response to the self-esteem question. Her self-esteem is not lowered. Were I weaker and blinder, I uh, might be happy. Do not repent with uh, 
so high and pure a feeling. This is Georgiana to Almer. You have rejected the best the earth could offer. Yeah, the best the earth could offer doesn't suggest that Georgiana is too... Uh, has low uh, self-esteem. Has low <laughs> self-esteem, that's true. Georgiana is saying, essentially, Almer, you are a jerk. And now that I know it, now that I have knowledge, as Eve did of the tree of knowledge, I cannot live. A fascinating uh, that's interpretation. That's a great interpretation of yeah. the end of the story. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, he deserves for her to die is basically <laughs> the idea there. Um, or she, he deserves for her to die. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, but about the this passage on Beatrice, how does this um, uh, complement the passage on uh, on G uh, Georgiana? How does that complement? While we're while we're thinking about that, that reference to the Virgin Zone, that was kind of like a tunic. Uh, a skirt that woman women wore around them, wasn't it? I mean, that's, that's, a, that's yeah, an article of clothing. Yeah, but it closing. does have the meaning of virgin zone, right. I think, for, right. for Hawthorne. He is, this is loaded with sexuality yeah. in a way. It's much more restrained in the Aylmer, in the story, yeah. the birthmark. Here, yeah. he's really bringing out in a hyper-intense way the way that Beatrice is a sexual figure and the way she's attractive because she's a virgin. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, what was pulled out in the birthmark story is even more true here and more overt yeah. that the, her sexuality is really at the center of um, everybody's, her, her father's and her, her lover's obsession. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have a comment. Same thing with Beatrice, referring to the previous comment. I believe she knows on some level that the antidote will kill her. Doesn't she say that there was more evil in Giovanni than her? Yes, she does. Yeah, that's, we're, we'll come we're jumping ahead, but, yeah. um, that's, and that's great. Mm -hmm. um, here, though, he doesn't really have a reason to think that what it sounds like in this passage is that because she's so beautiful and perhaps because she's so sensuous, he's afraid to touch her, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, of course, she's also poisonous, but the question is for him whether, and he's not sure of that yet, um, it sounds like his sense that she's toxic has more to do with how attractive she is than whether or not she actually is poisonous, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so, I'm sorry, let me move on. Well, one of the things that struck me about uh, Rappuccini's daughter was was the character of Giovanni. I mean, he's, he's kind of a... a Typical college freshman, you know, from from the hinterlands. He comes to the big city and he's um, he's exposed to all sorts of things that he hadn't been exposed to before, and he's really not sure of himself at all. He doesn't know what to make of this, and particularly this beautiful, attractive woman uh, who yeah. arouses all kinds of desire in him. Right, it's a new experience for him. Yeah, yeah, a little uh, bit, a little bit like a cosmopolitan experience. Yeah, a little, yeah. A, a little, a little echo or two of my kinsman Major Molino, another country bumpkin come to town. Right. Um, so now we're bringing out what uh, many of you have already noted. Uh, there are places in the text, many places in the text, where both are coded in terms of the story of the Garden of Eden and the ori and original sin. And this is a great point to pick up with the students to think about how Hawthorne's using this story. And here's one passing remark that's really interesting uh, because it relates to known sculpture by a famous American sculptor of Hawthorne's time that he's referring to. It's called Eve Tempted by Hiram Powers. So here's the passage. Um, Some fastidious persons, but they were exclusive of her own sex, affirmed that the bloody hand, as they chose to call it, quite destroyed the effect of Georgiana's beauty and rendered her countenance even hideous. But it would be as reasonable to say that one of those small blue stains, which sometimes occur in the purest statuary marble, would convert the Eve of Powers to a monster. Um, so the question is how, so here it's actually, um, it's other women, jealous women, women who are envious of Georgiana's attractiveness that are thinking this. Um, but why is she being compared to uh, a statue? First of all, a statue of Eve. Here she's being compared to Eve, um, a sculpture by a man of an image of Eve. Um, what, what might be some of the reasons uh, Hawthorne would insert that comparison? Why would <clears throat> why would he insert that? Uh, 
there we have a picture of uh, Eve tempted. Yeah, and this is the picture. There's a fruit in her hand. Mm -hmm. um, she's looking innocent because it's before she's eaten the fruit. Yeah, one of our participants earlier said it's always Eve's fault. Well, so true. Anyway. Yeah, okay, any comments? Why, why would he compare uh, Georgiana to the marble Eve? Uh, you know, just top of my head, a, a, a creation by a male, um, a, a image of perfection here, that statue, smooth, white, cool It's a man's marble. image of a, f a female perfection, which is a right. virgin, right. back right. to the virgin zone, right? right. Um, She's Galatea, she and, and he's Pygmalion. Maybe the statue is untouchable, as Georgiana is, kind of a Pygmalion and Galatea syndrome. We've had the Pygmalion. Great. Image yeah, that's twice. a great comparison, yeah. and we're going to uh, move to that right away because Pygmalion is mentioned in the other story. Um, oh, I don't think we're quite going to that here, uh, but we will in a minute. We'll go to the question of this of statuary, which is important for both uh, stories. Men who create statues of women. Mm -hmm. um, and Hawthorne seems to be su suggesting that Almer and Rappuccini and even Giovanni are thinking about women as artworks created by men. Mm -hmm. And the question is why? why? Why is that the way they're looking at, at women instead of as people who have agency mm -hmm. um, wait, or wait. who are even human? Because if they're statues, they lack an interior. They only have an exterior. We have a comment here. Eve was known to be a beautiful woman. Eve was a sinless person until the temptation of Satan. Uh, does that reflect the role of women in the minds of the writer? Staying uh, yeah, sinless right. until so that's the temptation. Question. Is it Hawthorne that has a problem and thinks of women? It's very powerful in the 19th century, the association of women with original sin. So women, in part, are, work hard to um, assert their purity uh, because any hint that they're less than fully pure uh, reminds everyone of the story of Eve. So it's Eve's fault. Adam's fall is Eve's fault, uh, right? And that that's very pre present in the minds of people who are writing in the 19th century. But the question is, is Hawthorne on board with this idea? Um, or is he criticizing, is he aligned with the male characters in the story? Or is he criticizing them? Um, so that's a major uh, question about how to interpret the story. Mm -hmm. Does Hawthorne also agree that women are sinful and uh, shouldn't be touched uh, without a glove? Or is he foregrounding something, a problem with the way the men are thinking? Mm -hmm. We have here two comments. Uh, <clears throat> regardless, Adam didn't have to eat the fruit. And in a similar vein, <laughs> actually Eve was deceived, but Adam chose. And Susan A. writes, it's about power, a rather cryptic remark. perhaps. Susan might want to elaborate on that. Maybe a statue is the only woman a man can, should touch. Aren't these Great. stories written in the time of the cult of true womanhood? I, we're yes, going to get to exactly that. That's right. They're written in precisely that time, and that's the kind of thing that I was just describing, this mm -hmm. idea that women are closer to God. As, and we're talking middle-class women, right? Right. Uh, Working-class women is a whole other thing. But... Um, and poor women. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, they're closer to God. They're the receptacle of virtue in the household. Men can be impure. They can go out and work and be morally impure. They have to for economic reasons. But women are supposed to preserve the virtue of the home and stay within the domestic sphere in enclosure, the kinds of enclosures that you see in the story, um, and the way Rappuccini has forced his daughter to stay inside this Garden of Eden um, because they should not be tainted at any cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that's great. That's a great observation. Um, and it would be, it's a way to talk about these stories in class to go into the cult of true womanhood in the 19th century.
Well, <clears throat> while our participants are responding to that, we have a really interesting comment from Elaine Baker. What comes to mind is a line from the Scarlet Letter. When Hawthorne refers to the sainted Anne Hutchinson, it seems to me that Hawthorne supported women's strength. That is an interesting comparison. We're comparing Beatrice and, G and Georgiana here, but when you begin to compare those two with Hester Prynne, uh, <clears throat> that's, that's, I think some fascinating contrasts come up. Uh, Eden is skewered <clears throat> in Rappuccini. Perhaps in Rappuccini, Beatrice is the Adam. Uh, the antidote is the fruit, and Giovanni is the Eve character. A ah, little gender bending there. Uh, he is thinking of her sexually, and what he sees uh, in result is death. Her sexuality is deadly. Yeah, so that's that's interesting. Here's a young guy encountering female sexuality and, again, doesn't know what to make of it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we have we have a mention here in the chat of Baglioni, and of course Baglioni is that warning character who alerts him to the uh, danger of Dr. Rappuccini. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. We have a, a comment here from Elaine Baker following up on her, uh, her, her gender-bending comment. My students have seen Giovanni as Eve and offer a great deal of discussion of who is the God figure. Is it really Rappuccini or is he the serpent? No right or wrong answer, but a great deal to think about. And then finally, they are motivated, the characters are motivated by immortality. Almer is seeking the elixir of life. and We've got that elixir in both stories.
While we're waiting for responses to that, <clears throat> we have a number of comments here. Uh, these two characters are interesting because they are members of the Enlightenment trying to uh, obtain romantic ideals. That's that Enlightenment now has come up twice, and that's that's really interesting. I I hadn't actually thought of Almer as a kind of an Enlightenment figure. He always struck me as more medieval. He's an alchemist, but be interesting to think of him that way. Rappuccini is a successful scientist, and Almer is a failure. All his experiments fail. Hawthorne has a problem with unbound intellectuality. As a character from Jurassic Park said, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should, or something to that effect. Both of them are too obsessed <clears throat> by scientific advancement. I believe untempered and self-relying intellectuality was his major flaw, uh, I guess, uh, Rappuccini's. I don't see Rappuccini as evil. He is trying to protect his daughter via science, which is his expertise. Chillingworth's flaw. Uh, <laughs> but he just has got to go back and finish that. Finish that. Coming. Yeah, without, without, we, yeah we, we've got about 45 minutes. Mm Those are the birthmarks.
-hmm. And while we're waiting for responses there, we have a really interesting comment from Merrill Bell. Might that also be Hawthorne's critique on the transcendentalist philosophy, their attempt to create perfection in human society? We haven't spoken about this, but, but of course, in the introduction to uh, Rappuccini's daughter, Hawthorne mentions the transcendentalists and talks about, uh, um, well, sort of his position between popular writers and transcendentalists. So how would you respond to that, Eliza? Is this a critique of transcendentalist philosophy, these two stories? And we have a comment, Pygmalion never found a real-life woman uh, who could satisfy him, so he had to make one. All these gentlemen are playing God, creating their own perfect Barbie dolls. And uh, we have... <laughs> and... <laughs> yeah, and then we have other comments. His audience wants to read about perfect women, maybe. That's an interesting point about audience. We might want to talk about that later on. In truth, Pygmalion's creation only takes life when the gods grant her life. The scientist seems to be bypassing the divine. And then we were talking about... Uh... <clears throat> And we have an, a question: Would a perfect woman stay with an imperfect man? Uh, I'm not. That sounds like a country and western song, but I mean. Yeah, yeah, a, a lot, Eliza, wouldn't you say that both uh, Georgiana and Beatrice are, are really not round characters, they're just sort of figures to be manipulated in the story? Mm 
Mm -hmm. This Any any takers on that question? <clears throat> it struck me that, as I was reading Rappuccini's daughter. It struck me that Rappuccini is a far more ominous figure. I, I mean, in particularly in that sort of that second uh, appearance uh, when he just sort of you know, walks by and glances at uh, Giovanni. He sort of at that point he he sort of targets Giovanni, and then the very next scene. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, Giovanni's landlady, is saying, oh, do you know there's a secret passage here? So pretty clearly, uh, uh, Rappuccini has set that up. He's he's far more ominous. I mean, old Almer's out there trying, and we see him. Giovanni, uh, we don't see him, and he's trying to corrupt and imprison uh, Giovanni. Uh, Rappuccini is trying to corrupt and imprison him, and we don't see him doing that. He, he struck me as a far more ominous character. Yeah, we have that in one of our comments. Rappuccini is like the distant puppeteer. See, great minds. Mm Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, it, it descent. Well, it, it shifts the center of the story to Giovanni and Beatrice, as Susan A has written here. Yeah, it could. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. We have a response here. We we have a okay. We have we have a response here to uh, our framing question. Uh, he is not in control of his lust, and that's what motivates him. And then another comment. I think Giovanni's relationship with Beatrice, though, is paramount for Hawthorne's themes about male female relations. His Giovanni's verbal abuse and censure of Beatrice is, to me, the most disturbing part of that story. Mm-hmm. 
Well, that that raises that that brings us to one of the questions in the chat here. Pat Marshall uh, has asked, "Is anyone in either story in control of his/her feelings?" That seems to be a huge issue in both pieces. Yeah, and then and then a response to why does Giovanni have such a strong attraction to Beatrice? The forbidden fruit is in reach, and that was fine until the forbidden fruit seemed to infect him. And then another comment: <laughs> This sounds to me like Giovanni's fear of losing himself, losing control. Because of his passion for her, uh, all related. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's certainly the young people uh, in the stories are not in control. Georgiana, Beatrice, and uh, Giovanni are being manipulated. But the older characters, um, are they in control of their feelings? They're, they're all rational characters. They seem to know what they're doing. How would you respond to that, Eliza? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true, yeah. <laughs> Hadn't thought of that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, and here I believe that Baglioni was in control of himself and knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah, back that that relates to your to your suggestion that it may be Baglioni's story after all. 
Uh, we have another comment. Both characters may feel that they're trying to regain control by reframing the women in their lives. Controlling female sexuality. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got time. We got plenty of time. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll give you a warning now. We got plenty of time. Okay, <clears throat> any takers on those questions? Uh, how are they, uh, in what ways are Giovanni's thoughts influenced by his preconceived notion of womanhood? And how are they preventing him from understanding the situation? Well, he's obviously panicking here. This is uh, the evidence that we refer to there is the uh, fact that uh, he killed a spider with his own breath. And uh, was it the flowers withered when he breathed on them? And, and so he's... Yeah, insects now, you know, uh, good women are not sexual. That's their, that's the preconceived notion of womanhood. He is overwhelmed by a sexual's feeling for her. It is always his fault. I guess it would never occur to him to talk to her about the situation. Uh, yeah, he's, he's setting up a test here, you know. She's going to have to pass or fail. Uh, but I'd cut him a little slack. I mean, if you started breathing on bugs and they started dying, you might be panicked too, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm.
Yeah, that's an interesting point. And one of the things that you notice in this story is that there is no Mrs. Rappuccini anywhere. You know, maybe, and there's no mention of a mother here. And maybe, maybe she got one too many bouquets from her husband. But uh, here we have a, an interesting comment from Pat Marshall. Uh, but they should <clears throat> be able to, and let's talk it out, I suppose. Uh, even have the duty to procreate, which Beatrice clearly can't. She is the antithesis of womanhood in that sense. I, I'm not so sure about that. That brings up a question that we had earlier in the chat about Rappuccini trying to create a super race. If they were to procreate successfully, would the children inherit the toxicity? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All those flowers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that right. Yeah, uh, Pat responds here. Unless she has a mate, though, who can be her husband, she is uh, unusable. So just her fertility is her fertility is limited. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Giovanni is somewhat sexist. Regardless of the evidence of male complicity, he will persist in blaming the girl. Yeah, he. Yeah, I, I think this goes back too to Giovanni's naivete. I mean, he is, after all, you know, this is like a college freshman, uh, and 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 um, he's he's smitten on one hand, but fearful on the other. He's not thinking straight. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting that Giovanni comes from Lombardy, and Lombardy is always associated with sunshine. And then when he comes to Padua, if I'm not mistaken, the description of Padua is that it's it's gray. It's yeah, so things are not as clear as they were back in old sunny Lombardy. Here we have uh, Susan writing, Giovanni is a voyeur. He gazes but does not act. Mm -hmm. And we have some comments. I find it interesting that the women get to have such an impact in the story at the end when they do not get uh, that same impact throughout the story. He just writes, no, she... Right. 
Uh, he thinks Georgiana is letting him off too easily. She is saying that he's too pure for her. I'm not sure it would occur to him to repent. It is a sh Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We also, yeah, in in birthmark, we also have um, Aminadab's laughter, which, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. I think Hawthorne was trying to show the irony of Almer. Yeah, not sure. I ask my students the same question, and it gets quite a bit of discussion. Another comment from Susan, if we look at the stories as a retelling of the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, after eating the apple and gaining knowledge, uh, can now see their nakedness. God tosses them from the garden, not for disobedience, because they can now see evil. He has made them mortal, because to know evil is forever, uh, to know evil forever is horrible. And Georgiana and Beatrice also gain knowledge and see that they cannot live. They too must leave the garden. Interesting, yeah, interesting interpretation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Merrill is talking or refers back to the irony uh, of Almer. The irony of Almer's desire for purity made it impossible for him to love a human woman. And then he just writes, <clears throat> uh, that's why I believe Aminadab is laughing at the foolishness of Almer. Also, Aminadab being this earthbound character, is, is his laughter is sort of representing, I think, the triumph of the earth, the triumph of, of you know, being simply human. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Mm hmm, mm -hmm. We have a comment. Georgiana leaves with more than human tenderness. That seems divine. Beatrice also ascends. It seems like they attain heaven. So in a sense, with that reading, they do attain perfection. And so in an ironic way, the two wizards succeed. Of course, they, they have to kill what they, what they were working with. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've often wondered about the scene after this where Giovanni and Rappuccini are left in the garden. Can Giovanni leave? You know, is he, is he 
too toxic to wander the streets of Padua? Are they stuck with each other? You know? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, we have a comment here. Pygmal Pygmalion accepts the gift of the gods, the gift the gods give him, but neither of these two men seem to be able to accept the statue they are given. Uh, <laughs> and we have someone agreeing with your yan 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 interpretation. I think there's a I think there's a dissertation in that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a comment. Uh, we have Susan writing, Almer fails to find the perfect future in the present, suggesting clearly that he learns nothing and will continue experimenting. All his experiments were failures. This is just another in a long list. He will go on clueless as ever. Almer the Clueless. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I yeah, this threw me uh, for a curve too. The the word failed there. It, it seems that he he didn't fail to look beyond the shadowy scope of time because he did try to live in all, for all he did try to live once and once for all in eternity it seems to me but he's got the word failed there so that really uh that really uh makes this very complex and and troubling um too ambiguous an ending there we go <clears throat> if his wife dying does not give him realization nothing will
We have some comments. He failed to live in the moment and appreciate what he had. He will not learn his lesson, but will continue to grasp at things that exceeds his grasp. You can't play God. Uh, Hawthorne may be making a comment in the obtuseness of men of his time regarding women. Then Susan writes, I don't see the ambiguity. What's ambiguous here? A, a far clearer thinker than I am, I'll tell you that. Almer will never come to an understanding because to gain immortality, true immortality, he would have had to have had children with Georgiana. That's that's an interesting, Susan, is an interesting point there. Pat Marshall, my kids always bring in the unstuck in time from Billy Pilgrim in Slaughterhouse-Five and argue that Almer's problem is that he can't lift himself out of the moment. So he's stuck in one moment that he cannot conceive that the moment will change especially since he can't control that moment. Ah, well, there you go. Yeah, a, a wonderful contract. Contest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Susan goes on, Hawthorne seems to be insisting that a solely rational approach to life does not work. Well, shall we look at uh, what Rappuccini and Giovanni did not know and wrap things up? Mm -hmm. And we don't know. He leaves us hanging. Yep, it ends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Susan gives us an interesting comment here. Hawthorne does not give us a moral. A moral would trivialize the stories in my belief. Yeah, the... Amar, I mean, the, uh, Hawthorne, you know, his, his stock in trade is ambiguity. And if he were to wrap it up nicely at the end, he would defeat everything that he's achieved thus far. That's a very good point.
Okay, and we have uh, uh, some concluding comments here. I like the endings. It gives students so much more to think about critically. It's nice not to have black and white answers, so students need to interpret and look for more answers. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our seminar. Are there any further questions or comments? Uh, my students absolutely adore these stories and Hawthorne in general. Well, good for them. Uh, classic American writer, of course. Uh, any other last-minute comments? Good seminar, lots to ponder. Well, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> um, Liza, I want to thank you very much uh, for your seminar this evening. You've certainly given us all a lot to talk about. Well, I hope so. I hope I didn't interrupt. Uh, uh, please, ladies and gentlemen, use the forum to continue the discussion and to share your approaches. Uh, we'll monitor the forum, so that means that any comments and questions that you pass in to us, we'll pass along to Eliza and we'll get back in touch with you. Please remember that we're going to alert you uh, when our new Hawthorne lesson goes online so that you'll be able to examine that. Please check AmericaInClass.org for our webinars. We're going to be posting our spring schedule very soon. Our next webinar is at 7 p.m. on November 13th. We're going to be teaching, it's going to be on teaching Thoreau's civil disobedience. Please submit your evaluations and then you'll be able to get your certificate of participation. And I want to thank all of you for your intelligent and enthusiastic participation this evening. You've made this a really excellent seminar. So ladies and gentlemen, let me wrap things up by saying thank you once again and good evening.